Mike, you want to tell us what you're doing? Uh, yes. Um, so this is the F8 digital fly-by-wire pallet. Um, this is the guidance system that flew on the F8 digital fly-by-wire experiment. And it has an AGC buried down in there, and we're going to read its ropes. Greetings Earthlings, if you follow the channel, you may know that we restored an Apollo Guidance Computer, or AGC for short, back to full functionality. We even flew moon landings running the original Apollo 11 mission software. In the AGC, the software was contained in 72 kilobytes of core rope memory. Core rope is a somewhat unique, very complicated, but very dense form of read-only memory. Dense for the time, that is. We explain how this crazy scheme works, where software is literally woven in ropes of wires in part 30 of this series. Since the AGC restoration, Mike Stewart has been on a mission to recover all the Apollo software from core ropes he can lay his sticky hands on, as most of the software has been lost to history. He even built his own core memory reader that he can just plug into his laptop so he can travel to wherever the core rope memory is and quickly recover its content. He has succeeded in reading quite a few already, the ones from the AGC at the Computer History Museum, the ones from an AGC that was going to be sold at our auction, and some from the MIT Museum. We also read some that were loaned to us by engineers that had worked on them. Don Isles himself, the programmer of the landing routines, and Eldon Hall, the chief engineer of the AGC. But today, Mike is going to use his rope reading contraption to read ropes from a quite special system. Um, so this is the F8 digital fly-by-wire pallet. Um, this is the guidance system that flew on the F8 digital fly-by-wire experiment. So the idea that since the yeah. Apollo was a fly-by-wire, the first fly-by-wire thingy that flew. Mm -hmm. They then tried it on a fighter plane yep. after the program. So they repackaged. There's even a picture of the, the, the disky hanging off the side of the plane. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're seeing here is a complete Apollo guidance system being repackaged by NASA for use in an F-8 fighter in order to demonstrate the first digital fly-by-wire system, first after the Apollo spacecraft, that is. This pallet is the actual system that flew on NASA's experimental plane. You can see it sitting atop the aircraft, just behind the pilot. The disk key, which was only used on the ground for maintenance and to load flight program parameters, was in the fuselage for easy maintenance crew access. The F-8 pallet is now part of Steve Jorvetson's amazing collection, which we have explored in previous episodes. Thank you, Steve, for giving us access to it. But before we reach inside this glorious pile of Apollo hardware, let me first explain the F-8 fly-by-wire program, how the hell a piece of the Apollo spacecraft found its way on an aircraft, and the intimate connection with the shuttle development program. So why would you even want to use fly-by-wire in airplanes? After all, they had been flying fine with trusty direct mechanical control so far. For large airplanes, the system had evolved to hydraulic-assisted mechanical controls, and that's what was originally installed in the F-8. Well, the problem is that direct inputs are far from ideal, particularly on very fast or very large airplanes. Ideally, you would want stick commands to give you predictable airplane control. Stick up and down gives you pitch, sideways gives you roll, and the rudder pedals gives you yaw, all in precise and proportional amounts, no matter your flight configuration. But in practice, it doesn't work that way, far from that. All the commands are cross-coupled, and controlling a plane, particularly in extreme conditions, is a bit of a messy business. Probably the simplest example is Dutch roll. When you start rolling the aircraft to initiate a turn, not only it rolls, but it yaws in the direction opposite to the turn, sometimes pretty severely. 
you have to compensate with your inputs and in some airplanes like gliders, you better stay on top of it with giant but well dosed rudder inputs, lest you'll fly it sideways or not at all. Finessing all of that is a whole lot of fun for pilots, but when you're flying in a combat situation, you'd probably prefer a plane that goes where you tell it to go and concentrate on your mission. The ultimate goal is flight augmentation, doing maneuvers that you could not do with manual controls. A computer would allow to fly planes that are unstable by design and could not be flown by a human, but would be far more performant. Which is pretty much what every modern fighter plane does today. You see them do maneuvers that look totally absurd. It's not only the pilot, it's the computer that is hard at work, balancing an unstable aircraft. So the potential benefits of a fly-by-wire system were well understood, and a few analog systems had already been demonstrated. But a digital version of it, controlled by a computer, that did not exist yet. There was simply no computer fast enough, small enough and reliable enough to do it. But that was about to change. Thanks to the Apollo program, NASA now had the AGC. So a program to demonstrate the first digital fly-by-wire system was started at NASA's Dryden Flight Research Center, blessed by no other than Neil Armstrong himself. NASA's Dryden Flight Research Center is located next to a large dry lake bed in Edwards, California. Saying that it is a very cool place for aviation is an understatement. That's where the Bell X-1 flew and broke the sound barrier. It still adorns the entrance to the center. Oh, and would that be a YF-12 plane here, the faster cousin of the Blackbird? Wait, that's the space shuttle being tested atop its modified Boeing 747 carrier. Dryden was of course closely involved with the Apollo space program. For one, that's where Neil Armstrong was working before he joined the space program for the Gemini mission. At Dryden, he was flying the X-15 experimental plane at the cool speed of Mach 5. In fact, the research center has now been renamed the Armstrong Flight Research Center in his honor. That's a very fitting honor, we think. Dryden is also where the lunar landing research vehicle was developed and flown. The LLRV was able to simulate the 1-6 gravity of the moon thanks to its middle turbine that would exactly cancel out 5 fifths of Earth's gravity. By the way, the LLRV tried to kill Armstrong too, but Armstrong was the fastest of the two and the only one to survive. But back to the digital fly-by-wire demonstration program. The F-8 Crusader was an old design from the 1950s, but had quite a high performance, capable of Mach 1.8 supersonic flight. And best of all, NASA got two freebies from the armed forces. It also had hydraulic assisted flight surfaces, so they just ditched the mechanical control system and reused the original hydraulic actuators. Even the backup was fly-by-wire. The new digital system would be the primary control, while an already existing triple redundant analog system built by Sperry would be the backup. No more mechanical control whatsoever, not even as a backup. The Apollo guidance computer would be the computer platform, although it was an interim choice for the first phase of the program. In phase 2, the computer would be swapped to the newly developed IBM AP101, the same that would be used in the space shuttle. More on this later. For phase 1, NASA reused not only the AGC, but the whole Apollo guidance system complete with the inertial measurement unit and all the attendant electronics. It was a good choice. The AGC was super reliable and would not fail either during the whole F-8 program. The same could not be said from the IBM AP101 that replaced it, which failed quite often. The AGC also came with the inertial measurement unit, the IMU, a multi-channel analog to digital box, the CDU, and a telemetry system to boot. It was such a good match that they made almost no modifications to the base system, 
which was an Apollo 14 LEM configuration. They kept the disk key as we saw, but the pilot had no interaction with it. Instead, another interface panel was added in order to select the different control modes being tested and to manually switch over each axis to the analog backup system. The benefits of using the Apollo system were overwhelming when considering the software side. The AGC already had a real-time OS with multiple hardware and software failsafe guards of the kind that let the computer reboot and simply kept going despite the 1202 errors. It also had a sophisticated development environment. The assembler ran on the Honeywell 1800 mainframe. Here you can spy Dan Leakley's tape mounted on the tape drive, the programmer who wrote the Apollo re-entry guidance. The MIT engineers had also developed an impressive software verification environment. You could run a full digital simulation on their monster IBM 36075. The large IBM machine ran an emulated AGC and a digitally simulated flight environment. But even with one of the most powerful computers of the time, this was still far from a real-time simulation. So for that, MIT had developed a hybrid simulator. The hybrid simulator used an actual AGC, augmented by emulated core ropes fed by magnetic tapes and a large blink and light debugging panel. It used an SDS 9300 24-bit digital computer to run the flight simulation. And when that was not fast enough for real time, it used two Beckman E's 2133 analog computers that could do complex computations much faster than the digital computer could. You could then fly the whole thing from a CM cockpit or a LEM cockpit nearby. A similar simulation setup was developed for the F-8 at Dryden, using a second F-8 that stayed on the ground, which they called the Iron Bird. They could simulate and fly the complete hardware and software with a fidelity suitable for man rating. And although it had taken a team of 400 people to develop all this for Apollo, the entire F-8 Phase 1 was done with just 9 programmers, all former Apollo, in less than a year. Up to 60% of the software was taken straight from the Apollo 14 LEM software. That could not have been achieved in that time frame with any other computer. Thank you, Apollo program. There was one major fly in the ointments, though. The core rope manufacturing line was going to be shut down in 1972. So they only manufactured a single set of core ropes. It better worked, because they would not have been able to make any changes after that. To preserve some flexibility, they parametrized the hell out of the program with 168 settings having to be loaded before flight, from paper tape and the disk key, mind you. On top of that, they provided 16 jump points to programs in RAM to provide memory resident patches, called erasable memory programming here, which they used to make subsequent modifications. The phase one flight test campaign lasted a year and a half from May 1972 to November 1973 for a total of 42 flights. It achieved all of its objectives. Phase 2 was equally successful. In these plots, taken when flying in formation or in gun runs, you can see how much better the plane is behaved when the system is switched on, requiring far less corrections from the pilot. The Phase 2 F-8 also flew many missions in direct support of the shuttle development program, a task that was facilitated by now having the same computers as the shuttle. They flew many a landing approach on the F-8 before the shuttle did. One critical contribution was the study of pilot-induced oscillations, or PIO as they called it. There had been a scary incident early in the test flights of the shuttle, when it was landing in the very capable hands of Fred Hayes, the Apollo 13 astronaut, and developed strong PIO. This was caused by excessive delay in the control system. 
The effect was studied in the F8 and that's the footage of the F8 you usually see with this huge and scary PIO. They had artificially increased the delay on purpose to find how far they could push it before causing PIO. Clearly, they just had found the limit. The shuttle control was fixed thanks to these experiments. Alright, sorry, we rat hold once again. Back to our actual hardware. So it has AGC, CDU, PSA, IMU, so this is the, a complete system. Just about, yeah. This, this is a signal conditioner assembly. Or sorry, not a signal conditioner. This is a, a pulse torque assembly that has been modified in some way because it has a Delco Electronics tag for the digital fly-by-wire stuff. Um, it has the same form factor, so it's some sort of modified PTA. So there's um, some modifications to the yeah. thing. There is, of course, no telescope, right? They didn't yep. align it on stars. Um, and then there's, you know, the additional hardware like this box that's hiding the AGC that was just, you know, this is the interface box assembly, so presumably just converting between the right. signals required by the aircraft and the, what the pings can provide. And this IMU is really interesting, by the way. Um, it turns out they reused components a lot. Okay. Uh, and the three PIPAs, the accelerometers inside that IMU, were the ones that flew Apollo 12 to the moon and back. They came from the Apollo no 12 command kidding. module. kidding. And two of the IRIGs were flown as well. One of them flew on Apollo 7, I think, and the other flew on Apollo 9. Wow. Yeah. So, 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 so some stuff that went through, well, stuff that went through space and some that went from to the moon. Yeah. Wow. The AGC was originally installed in WEM2. Uh, it got removed for modification at mm -hmm. some point. The PSA, I think, was assigned to LEM14 before it got canceled. Uh, LEM14 got canceled? Yeah, it would oh, have flown on like Apollo 18 or 19 or something. Oh, okay, 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 okay because they did number those. Yeah. LEM14 doesn't mean Apollo 14. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. um, Speaking of Apollo 14, though, the ropes that we're going to read are uh, set 8 of Aurora 88, which is the final lunar module system test rope. And set 8, at least in 1969, was the set of test ropes assigned to LEM 8, which is what flew on Apollo 14. Yeah. I don't know why they're in this. I don't know why this doesn't have the F8 ropes, because the ropes are behind this box, so it's not. You actually have to go out of your way to change the rope modules. You have to take yes. this box off. Yeah, what? Why would they, have, they put back some Apollo software on it? They, I don't know. I have no idea. It's very interesting. <laughs> or they wanted to protect the F8. Uh, yeah, it could have been secret. Secret or something, and removed it. I thought for a little bit that maybe they were feeding the um, the rope that flew on the F8 was called Dig Fly. Um, <laughs> okay. Dig fly. Oh, digital fly. Yeah, yeah they had an eight character limit yeah. for their name, but they could also set the author of the mm -hmm. rope. So mm -hmm. the full name of, of the rope was Dig Fly by Wire as mm -hmm. the author. So mm -hmm. they kind of spell out the whole Dig mm -hmm. Fly by Wire. Anyways, um, I thought for a minute that like maybe they maybe they fed the dig fly rope into the test connector like we did mm -hmm. when on our restored agc you know like running oh, sort of like a corporate okay. simulator but it's this um this agc has a, a restart monitor plugged in there which just adds channel 77 so this means that most likely they didn't do that so yeah I'm, i have i have no good theories <laughs> Well, you have more th theories than anybody. <laughs> and while we are at it, we were drooling. We are in, in Steve Jervis's cave, and we were drooling at this, which we didn't see last time, which is the Apollo SPS service module engine, the one that brings you back from the moon back to Earth, or allows you to get into orbit on around the moon. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, it is. And I was told it was, so this I did, didn't know, it's redundant. This is two rocket engines in one. Everything is dual. So if you have one set of injectors that doesn't work, you use the other set and you can still go back home. 
Uh, that's an impressive beast next to the RL10. Actually, it's quite sizable <laughs> compared to the RL10, mm -hmm. right? Uh, once it has the bell on it, it's probably much bigger. Oh, yeah. So it's a much larger pressure fed engine for reliability. And we figured out that these were not the oil filters. <laughs> they were the uh, gimbal actuators. So there is one that's hooked up to the engine, from the ring to the engine, and one that's hooked up to the spaceship itself. And then here's it. So it mounts from this ring from the bottom, actually, not from the top. Oh, too many things to look at. <laughs> All right, so uh, you're here for the rope, and you have your core rope reader. Let's do it. The pin spacing looks like those are probably Malco pins. It's another logic box, maybe. Yeah. Or oh, for the, I suppose they had different sensors, right? Because they need to figure out what the what the input of the pilot is. Mm -hmm. And down there is our nicely radioactive AGC. Oh man, six ropes. Three. Three of them are jumper mods. Oh, okay. Although it's 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 the most amount of ropes I've ever seen, so I get all excited. These two huh? look suspicious to me. <laughs> They're kind of like darker gray around the lettering. It's almost like they uh, they over relabeled over -labeled it. it. So I'm I'm gonna pull these and make sure that there's not a actually anything in them. Uh huh. <laughs> oh, that's a fitting. So those are the. It's full of hydraulics because they have the cooling plates. Yep. So if you were to run that, we would have to hook it up to a chiller, which is okay, which you, you'd expect, right? right? There you go. There's number one. Hello. Mr. Ken just arrived. So, how's it going? Well, we already looking at other things like then Mike is being very expeditious he's already got some interesting the oh there's some rework, rework. Yeah. tape no that's that's a uh, rework epoxy or something yeah so they, they they went in there so you can mm -hmm. repair core modules too huh I think this is this is going to be over one of the diodes this is the, uh, the, the the SPS, so this is the, the engine at the back of the common module. Is this one? It's empty. It's a jumper. Why oh, is not a jumper? It's um. I don't know. I would expect sort of the resistor assembly to be up there, but this is kind of evenly weighted, so I don't know. I'm going to stick it in the rope reader and see <laughs> if I see anything. You can read jumpers. <laughs> so is this whole platform supposed to accelerate? Yeah, there's one over here, a little accelerometer that they stuck in there. Oh, there are two. Yeah, the, this whole pallet went into the X, as is. X and Y. But th those are additional, or oh, maybe those are the Replacing the B mags? I mean, the the pings didn't use the B mags at all. So oh, it's only for the SCS. Okay. So I know they they added stuff to it. Oh, it goes to its no, it's independent. It goes to its own wiring system, so it goes from here. And at least see yellow wire addition is over here. They're all heavy, so they're huh. they're either there's either something structural in there or they're just Pot potted, potted completely. They just like completely filled them with potting material. No, I, I won't be able to read this one at least. <laughs> I just noticed it missing doesn't have pins. pins. It's missing the drive pins. Okay, so it's definitely a jumper then, or can you? It's missing the drive pins. Or I can the drive pins were the root. Are they all like that? One of them is not like that. This one, this one is not. 
And it's the one that doesn't have the suspicious lettering. <laughs> Weird. That box is the cooling system. I didn't realize that. Bleed valve coolant, side glass coolant. Valve manual two ways. Oh, no, I'm good, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Coolant pressure gauge. Oh, I like this valve that looks like it's from like a garden home. Liquid nitrogen? No, LN2. Till There's a lit. nitrogen gas vent here, so probably liquid nitrogen. You cool it with liquid nitrogen? Oh yeah, it could be. Yep, they simply cooled it with liquid nitrogen, which made the system totally independent from the rest of the aircraft, but limited flight time to about an hour and a half, I think. LN2 fill inlet fitting. Yeah, liquid nitrogen. And this LN is liquid nitrogen. Recovered. Okay. Next. All right. I think your your box needs a little more drama. <laughs> it, it gave us a little bit of drama because I had my address in slightly wrong the first time I did something. Yeah, but but. There, there needs to be like you know a big panel meter that you watch charge up. And <laughs> <laughs> it should make like a, like a whining noise. So did you recover block ones? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that, that worked fine. Yep, yeah, it works fine. Um, there was the one rope, I think I told you about this, that had a dead diode but also a broken core. Oh, yeah. I lost eight memory locations from that. Turns out that I found somebody that has the same module. So, chances of him having the same core broken is incredibly small. So, I'm going to read that next month. So, you, you could get the lost data back from Faraday? No, not with the broken core, because you lose all of the bits of eight words. You just get basically nothing for those eight words. So I think I've recovered them via reverse engineering. Okay. But you want to be sure? Yeah. yeah one more? Yep. This is the one that had the rework. You suspect on a diode, you have seen a few bad diodes. Not on, not this type of diode, which is why it's kind of weird. Um, actually, we can take a look at the model and see where that rework is. Uh, the rework, I think, was over here. Ish. So it's either hitting one of these, which is a resistor, or oh so you have access to the cordwood components on the side i get it <coughs> actually i think that's just a resistor <coughs> right there, right? resistor yeah so there's just resistors in that how can a resistor go bad i don't know <laughs> I, I, that's assuming i'm remembering correctly which side mm -hmm. it's on so let's pull it out and take a look and this block over here is yeah, 203052. So, yeah, it just would have been one of these resistors, sort of halfway down the line. Oh, you're running them? There you go. Okay. Right. We're just running the ropes that we just recovered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So that's similar to what you ran when we tested the computer. Let me put it back on for the first time. Can we do the RAM test and all that good stuff? That's what I'm running right now. Mm -hmm. But like how similar this is is a really, really interesting question. <laughs> because what we ran was called Aurora. Mm -hmm. And this is Aurora. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they're the same Aurora. <laughs> don't you think they are significantly different? I think so. Um, so you don't have a listing for that one? We don't have a listing for this. Ah, so this is totally new software for you. Yes. So this is this is revision 88 of Aurora, which mm -hmm. was released in <laughs> March, and March '96. Aurora 12 is from November of '96. '66. Yeah, '66. Uh -huh. Yeah. So Aurora 12 came out much later than Aurora '88. What? <laughs> <laughs> Program Aurora by DAP Group, the Digital Autopilot Group. Mm -hmm. Aurora should have been owned by the LEM Group for the System Test Group. I'm pretty sure what happened is they revised Aurora all the way up to 85 and then branched off into Sunburst, which was Apollo 5. And then the DAP group, which was part, partly done by contractors external to MIT, branched off of Sunburst, called Aurora, possibly not knowing that that name was already taken. So the Aurora that we got from Don has a lot of DAP code in it. What we were running as our Aurora was much more close to the early revisions of Sunburst, like around Sunburst 10 or so, and not Aurora 85 or 88. So Aurora is just test. The real Aurora is just test. Yeah. It was the first LM world they ever made. And so to create the Apollo 5 software, they branched off of Aurora and started developing some Oh, so there is some code that made it in the flight software from that? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, sun, Sunburst, that's, yeah, no, I think it's coming back to me, that's the title of Don Isle's book. Right. Yeah, yeah, Sunburst in the menu. Yeah. He skipped over Sundance. You think, but this is earlier, so this, this might have less flight software. This doesn't have any. Okay. So it's the, it's the pure and adultered. Right. Original test of UGC. Mm -hmm. It'll be very interesting to disassemble yeah, yeah, this and yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, just work on your hands. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so much work to do. <laughs> well, congrats for recovering yet a um, few more ropes. Yeah, thank you. So this adds to the growing set of ropes recovered by Mike. It was not quite the ropes we expected to find, but it was nonetheless the important Aurora 88, the first LEM rope ever produced, representing the complete LEM HEC test set. And this is just the beginning for Mike, as he then works on disassembling the recovered code to reconstitute the source code, something he has been pretty successful at. The result of his work is accessible on the virtual AGC GitHub. Congrats, Mike, you are doing more Apollo software recovery by yourself than all the museums in the world combined. See you in the next episode.